Hello, everyone. I'm Shuling Ran from uh, School of Mechanical Engineering and the Burke Nanotechnology Center at Purdue University. Today uh, is my great pleasure to talk about our work on the full daytime subambient radio cooling in commercial like paints with high figure merit. I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Peter Bermel and uh, Jeremy Mandai, for inviting me uh, to give a talk here. Um, so here shows that uh, the air conditioners are used uh, everywhere on, in the world. Uh, but when we uh, reject the heat to the uh, ambient, it make urban cities hot. As you can see from this uh, sort of infra image of the cities it can be much hotter than the rural uh, areas. So um, air conditioning not only costs uh, a big portion of the electricity, uh, no matter in commercial uh, sector or the residential sector, but also account for 113.6 million metric tons of a CO2 emission. So um, what can we do uh, with that? Uh, so um, before we can find the solution, uh, we can look at the household with air conditioners uh, in 2018. Uh, the United States, Japan, and South Korea are, are examples of the so developed countries with a matured market, but the uh, new air conditioners are still needed to replace the old ones. China has really picked up uh, in the last decade or so. And the other emerging economies like India, uh, Brazil, uh, there's still uh, a huge market in the next few decades. Uh, it has been predicted that by 2050, uh, the number of air conditioner units will triple uh, so uh, we, uh, on, one, on one side, it's good to improve the quality of living of uh, people. On the other hand, uh, it contributes to many challenges we are facing for the climate. So uh, we have heard about stories like uh, Antarctica locked the highest temperature on record, polar bears uh, losing their homes because ice glaciers are melting on the uh, north and south poles. Uh, so what can we do with uh, the climate change? How to address it? Well, uh, we, are, we have been looking at the conventional air conditioning sector to see if any solutions are, are, are possible. So, um, you know, air conditioner works in the way that it uses electricity to move the heat from inside the house to the outside, but the electricity also being converted to heat. Uh, so one, problem is that electricity used often comes from carbon emitting processes. And, um, uh, you know, uh, again, it leaves even more heat on the earth rather than dump to uh, elsewhere. So these contribute to uh, heat anon effect in urban cities, as well as uh, global warming. So we wonder if there is a way to dump the heat to a deep space or even for free. Okay, so radio cooling has been a promising uh, option uh, for that. So to understand radio cooling, uh, we look at a system composed of uh, the sun, uh, deep space, atmosphere, and the Earth's surface. So the sun shines about 1,000 watts per meter square to the Earth's surface that uh, composed of uh, UV uh, visible and uh, near air portions with their fractions of energy here. At the same time, the Earth's surface emits energy as well because of the temperature is much lower. Uh, the emission peak is around 10 micron. And there's a, uh, a, a kind of a spectral range from eight to 13 micron uh, where the atmosphere is transparent to uh, the radiation. So we call this uh, spectral range as sky window. And the Earth's surface would emit about 150 watts per meter square energy in the sky window. Now imagine if your surface has such selected um, uh, emissivity uh, that uh, is almost zero uh, for the solar spectrum. In other words, it is highly reflective uh, in the solar spectrum, but the emissive in the uh, sky window. So what happens is uh, nearly all the solar energy will be reflected at the same time. Uh, the surface the only emission can go through the atmosphere and lose to, lost to the deep space. And if you look at energy balance, uh, we can immediately realize that now the Earth's surface is losing energy overall. So it can be cooled down and eventually uh, cooled below the ambient temperature. So 
really cooling is not a, a new sort of a principle. It was uh, known for, for centuries. For example, uh, in an article um, in Scientific American uh, in the 1850s, uh, it introduced uh, sort of a tells the story that uh, people use uh, really cooling to uh, make ice in the Asian times in the hot and dry climate. So that's interesting. Um, so in the modern era, uh, people started uh, pursuing really cooling paints uh, in 1960s and then 70s. So uh, for example, this is a TiO2 paint uh, on uh, uh, aluminum substrate. It shows uh, two degrees below the ambient temperature in a winter day, but uh, the high reflectance comes from the substrate rather than the paint itself. So it, had, it doesn't demonstrate the uh, substrate independence. Other um, paints uh, has been explored, but uh, the reflectance in, with the paint alone is fairly low uh, or modest uh, at, the, at, the, you know, at, the, at the best, so 80 to 90 percent, such that it gains too much heat from the sun and uh, has a weak daytime performance. Uh, at the same time, uh, well, in the last uh, decade or so, uh, great success have been achieved uh, in, on other nine paint approaches, such as multi-layer nanofilms, silica mirror, uh, thin film back on a metal uh, uh, substrate and the denignified wood. So uh, these uh, advances are very uh, encouraging, however, they are either limited by and being not, not being scalable or having a metal uh, layer on the back or the layer has to be very thick to function. So we still need uh, more viable solutions such as the paint approach. So some years ago, uh, our group uh, looked into a paint approach and tried to see whether it is feasible to cool below the ambient with the paint. So we consider double layer TiO2 coating where the top layer is a TiO2 polymer composite to reflect the sunlight, and the bottom is a carbon uh, black layer to uh, ensure high emissivity. So in our modeling, uh, directly solving Maxwell equation would be very expensive. Uh, so we uh, uh, eventually use the Lorentz mean theory uh, to analyze the photon interaction. So for the composite, we first look at individual particle, and using the mean theory, uh, they can tell us. Uh, the absorption coefficient, scattering coefficient, and the phase function. With that information, uh, then we track the trajectory of the photons uh, put into the system and look at how they scatter through the system or absorb or transmit it eventually. So we can track uh, the reflectance, transmittance, and the absorptance eventually. Uh, so we're glad that this paper, early study on the theoretical study on pain has been uh, named a highly cited paper by Web of Science uh, last year. So we first look at two ideal uh, mid IR emitters. One uh, emitter has a narrow band, uh, perfect uh, emission in the sky window. Emitter two has uh, not just the uh, perfect emission in the sky window, but also outside of sky window in the uh, mid IR region. That means with the uh, emissivity outside sky window, the surface is gonna interact with the atmosphere uh, with uh, radiation exchange. So our results show that actually these two ideal emitters, their cooling power crosses at a certain surface temperature when the ambient temperature is 300 Kelvin. So interestingly, uh, when you are below 280 Kelvin, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the actually uh, ideal emitter one performs better with higher cooling, uh, cooling power. While when you go above 280 uh, Kelvin, uh, the um, uh, broadband emitter performs better. Okay, so the reason being when your surface temperature is high, actually you can use uh, the emission outside of scan window to lose heat to atmosphere as well. Uh, so you can gain uh, additional cooling power. However, if your goal is to cool your surface uh, as low temperature as possible, we should use uh, the narrow band uh, emitter because it eliminates the heat load from the atmosphere now, because now the atmosphere is hotter than your surface and can uh, put the load if your uh, emissivity is a broadband, okay? 
So that's interesting that depending on whether you wanna uh, operate uh, near uh, ambient temperature or above uh, or below, much below the ambient temperature, I mean, we should look for surfaces with different uh, uh, emissivity features. So the scattering coefficient and, and reflectance are, are shown here with different uh, radius. As you can, say, you can see that uh, each particle size can reflect or scatter one wavelength uh, very well. And uh, when we increase the particle size, it starts to uh, reflect the longer wavelengths better. Uh, this can be showing the reflectance uh, profile as well. Uh, when uh, you go to a larger particle size, the scattering for short wavelengths is not as, as strong, but uh, uh, the scattering and reflection for longer wavelengths become better. And the, the uh, reflectivity is more balanced across the entire wavelengths range. So this has consequences as we're gonna explain later. Then uh, with our uh, coding system, we predict a fairly high reflectance in the solar spectrum of 91%, uh, as well as a high sky window emissivity 0.95. And with uh, these numbers, we uh, predict the cooling power for a few different convection heat transfer coefficient. Uh, first, when there is uh, no convection heat, heat load, we are able to actually cool the surface more than 20 degree Kelvin below the ambient temperature. Now, when the H is 6 to 12 watts per meter square Kelvin, uh, we can still cool the surface uh, above, five, uh, above 5 to 10 degree uh, below the ambient temperature. So that's uh, when you reach the stagnation temperature uh, where the cooling power becomes zero. So this shows that the, you know, the daytime below ambient cooling is really feasible with even TiO2 system. Okay, a few other groups experimentally attempted uh, this problem as well. So this is a New Mexico group. They try single oxide microsphere bed without polymer matrix. So they achieved uh, uh, nighttime cooling and a partial daytime cooling, except for around noon hours. Uh, the, uh, particle bed is still warmer than the ambient temperature. Now, another uh, group from Columbia University, uh, they demonstrate full daytime ambient, uh, below ambient cooling in these uh, uh, polymer, uh, porous polymer composites. So instead of particles, now they have matrix, but then they use pores to scatter light. Okay, um, so uh, these uh, polymer, although uh, pretty expensive, and the la layer thickness needs to be pretty large to, to function. So uh, scalable commercial like uh, paints based on particle polymer matrix format are still much needed. Uh, so uh, then we were considering what about we use a hierarchical particle size Would that give us any enhancement? Uh, so let's see, so this is done by my student, uh, Joe uh, Peoples. Um, so we look at the, our experimental data on the TiO2 uh, film with 8% uh, volume concentration in acrylic, thickness of one millimeter and uh, particle diameter 104 nanometer. So interestingly, we measure 90.1% reflectance, but our simulation only says 84.2%. Uh, so this is a fairly big discrepancy. So uh, when we look closer to uh, the SEM image, we find that uh, the average diameter is uh, 104 nanometer. However, we have a fairly appreciable size range with some smaller particles and larger particles. So the standard deviation is actually 37 nanometer. And uh, uh, we kind of uh, uh, now try to consider these, uh, these effects. So let's first look at uh, the performance of single particle size as a baseline. So we already seen a little bit of results before, but now let's look at more systematically. So if, when the diameter is 100 nanometer, it scatters the UV uh, light the best, but not the other bands. 200 nanometer diameter scatters and reflects the visible band the best, and the 400 nanometer scatters uh, the near are the best, and is also the best overall performer. Okay, so uh, no single uh, particle size can scatter all the bands uh, the best. That kind of makes us wonder, can we, combine the different particle size so that they can work together to uh, be responsible for, for different um, wavelengths. Okay, uh, so uh, we kind of did that. We include the different particle size 
Now, uh, with the size distribution, we're able to uh, achieve 89% uh, reflectance in our simulation, which agrees much better uh, with the experimental data. So that really uh, kind of inspired us to uh, intentionally look for uh, the multiple particle size effect, whether it can give us much better uh, reflectance. So we constructed this uh, A, B, C, D, each is a uh, combination of a different particle size, like A, most likely the smaller has more weight on the smaller particle size. So these are uh, their uh, scattering coefficients and absorption coefficients from scattering coefficients. You can see that the multiple particle size, uh, they do not have uh, sharp peaks anymore. They have much more balanced uh, scattering over entire wavelength range. Okay, so uh, these are uh, the reflectance uh, of the uh, the visible uh, the UV visible near our portion uh, uh, for the single size and uh, the different combination of uh, multiple sizes. If we zoom in, we can see that um, uh, the uh, you know the particle uh, design D has the highest reflectance in the UV portion. Well, it has the the most best balanced reflectance for uh, the uh, near air portion as well. Although uh, some, in some wavelengths, the other designs may be better, but uh, overall it has a constantly high reflectance uh, through uh, the entire wavelength range. So um, when we look at our ABCD again, A still uh, reflects UV the best, B reflects visible the best, C reflects near air the best, but uh, D is behind them, not by, not by, not by a big margin. So, Interestingly, although design D does not reflect any of these band the best, but is the best overall performer, which means that when you have balanced uh, particle size to, to scatter each, uh, uh, each band uh, well and without any weakness, uh, you could be the overall uh, best performer. So we got like 3% enhancement compared to the best single particle size. And that's a big deal actually for radio cooling. It represents about 30 watts per meter square uh, cooling power uh, gain. So which is good. Well, uh, then we kind of uh, consider uh, these optimization and uh, we try the best for TiO2. It still only show partial daytime cooling during noon hours our uh, TiO2 ping still warmer than the ambient temperature. So we uh, look at the band gap, you know, TiO2 has a moderately high band gap, but it absorbs UV. So that's probably the problem. Then we kind of turn our attention to aluminum oxide, barium sulfate, and the calcite. So as you increase the, the band gap, they're not no longer going to absorb the UV photons. But uh, one drawback is our return index decreases as well. So that will weaken uh, your, your scattering. Then we have to use higher volume concentration to ensure good scattering. Okay, so uh, that kind of uh, uh, turns out to be our calcite acrylic cooling pain work, where you can see uh, the regular images and the SEM images. They have uh, elliptical shapes with a long kind of, uh, uh, you know, lens in the, in the axial direction and the shorter diameter direction, but it covers uh, the good uh, range of the size to scatter all wavelengths. And we characterize the reflectance and the absorptivity over the UV visible near our TL mid IR portion. Now we have ultra high reflection of 95.5% uh, in the solar spectrum and the emissivity of uh, 0 0.94 uh, for the mid IR. So, uh, so the success of these uh, material system is based on our journey of uh, a few uh, innovations, including uh, wide band gap fillers, high particle concentration, 60%, and broad size distribution. So uh, by the way, this work was done by my former PhD student, Dr. Shang Yuni, who is a uh, postdoc at MIT right now, as well as my current PhD student, Joseph Peoples. So we published paper last year in Cell Reports Physical Science, and we filed uh, uh, international patent uh, much earlier. Now we characterize the full, time, full daytime subambient cooling performance. Uh, there are two testing systems. One is um, uh, we just uh, put the film under 
uh, the sun and sky and see how many degrees can, can be cooled below the ambient temperature. The other cooling power testing, we put a feedback heater at the back to heat the sample and to be the same temperature ambient. And the heat input will be the net cooling power uh, our surface can provide when this temperature is the same as ambient, when, you know, when there's no convection, conduction, uh, parasitic heating. So all the power is uh, by the interaction with the sun and the deep space. As we can see that uh, it maintains a full daytime subambient cooling, uh, about 10 degrees Celsius during night and uh, 1.5 degrees below the ambient, even uh, at the, the, you know, uh, the most uh, toughest time, uh, noon hours. So the cooling power is about 37 watts per meter square entire, through the entire 24 hour hours. And we have even more straightforward way to demonstrate the cooling performance. We have the P pattern uh, painted by our paint and the background by commercial paint. Under regular camera, you don't see much, but uh, under infrared camera, you see the P is much cooler than the commercial paint. So we did the same. Um, uh, we went ahead and tried brown sulfate acrylic acrylic cooling paint also. Uh, so the film version is uh, without matrix and the paint version is with acrylic matrix. Again, uh, now here we even get, get uh, better reflectance is a 98.1% uh, solar reflectance. We believe this is the highest reflectance uh, for paints. Uh, and we got 0.95 or 96 emissivity in the sky window. So uh, now we even get even better cooling performance in the field test. So uh, the cooling below ambient is about 10 degrees uh, during nighttime and at least 4.5 degrees Celsius uh, during noon hours. And the cooling power, uh, depending on your ambient temperature is around 80 uh, when the ambient is, is cold and to uh, 110 when the ambient is, is, is hot. Okay, so uh, we did a uh, simulation to show, further show the benefits of a high concentration and the multiple particle size. As you can see for both uh, paint formula, uh, the solar reflectance increases with uh, the particle concentration. However, if you use single size, uh, even with 6% concentration, you will only get a 91% reflectance. Now, if, uh, when you sort of uh, use multiple particle sizes, you can boost the reflections by a few percent and make them ultra high. So uh, these are like the key features that uh, will make our paint much more uh, reflective than the other available paints. So we further uh, define our radio cooling figure merit. So it is given by uh, uh, the sky window emissivity minus R times one minus uh, solar reflectance. So this really means the absorptivity uh, to the sunlight. Okay, uh, so R is the solar irradiation divided by ideal sky window emission. So when you multiply RC by the sky window emissivity power from the surface, you basically get the cooling power. So uh, because the sun irradiation is much stronger than the emissive power from the surface, so reducing uh, the absorptivity or enhancing the solar reflectance is more important than enhancing the emissivity. Okay, so uh, that lead to R about 10 uh, value. Well, when we compare our figure merit, we see that our paints has a figure merit comparable or even higher than the, the other reported uh, uh, state of the art approaches. So that's very nice. So we are kind of uh, uh, pleasantly or uh, sort of uh, uh, presently surprised that uh, our recalling paints uh, got a lot of traction in the uh, general public and the popular news media. It was covered by uh, BBC, uh, CNN, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, and even um, you know, featured in uh, talk shows. So that's really to our surprise, so, of course, uh, by the uh, serious uh, you know, science magazine uh, and other, other, other media. Um, so that's kind of the design uh, was really still empirically uh, trial and error. We wonder that do we, uh, whether we can come up with, with a way to systematically design uh, the material. So we use first principles 
to predict optical uh, properties. So for the UV visible and ER portion, optical response is due to electronic transition. Well, in the mid IR region is phone on frequency and lifetime. And together we can predict N and the kappa value. So uh, these are electronic structures of our brom sulfate pain, uh, as well as the benchmark system that's sitting in the oxide. We can see both of them have high uh, band gaps, which means they will not absorb UV, and uh, that is great. Uh, in addition, brom sulfate, uh, barium sulfate, uh, uh, has a, a, a smaller band gap, which means it's going to have a higher rehab index, which is beneficial for scattering. We're going to see the consequence, All right? So for the uh, media IR portion, uh, the optical response is described by the Lorentz Ossinger model. You can model this with a spring mass system with damping. So the value function is given by the Lorentz model. Uh, we have Ossinger strengths and the resonant frequencies are basic phonon frequencies. And damping factor is um, uh, three and a four phonon scattering. So these are the phonon structure uh, or phonon dispersion. We can see again for both materials, we have uh, zone center phonon modes uh, in the sky window, which is good because uh, we, uh, these modes will absorb uh, uh, the photons uh, in the sky window, which means they're gonna also emit photons in that region. It just said that barium sulfate has more modes available. Probably that tells us it's gonna have a better, uh, cons you know, constant, constantly high absorption across the entire sky window region. Okay, we predicted the optical constants. Uh, so you can see that for sitting the oxide, uh, our first principle uh, predicted optical constant agree with the experiment very well, uh, really well, actually. And, uh, but our prediction for barium sulfate still needs uh, experimental validation on the, uh, in the kappa. But the one interesting result is that barium sulfate, because of the smaller band gap, it has slightly higher N value than uh, sitting dioxide. Um, and its kappa value uh, is kind of a more uh, sort of a, more, more of a, like a, has less oscillation than sitting dioxide, you know, it's, it has a uniformly high, uh, more uniformly high absorption, okay? Now, then we can put those properties into the Monte Carlo simulation to model uh, the reflectance and uh, absorption. So again, for now for brom sulfate versus the sitting dioxide, indeed we see higher solar reflectance uh, for brom sulfate because of the higher end value. We also see higher uh, emissivity uh, of uh, barium sulfate in the sky window. Uh, there is no dip at all, while for sodium dioxide, you'll see a dip because there is no absorption mode available uh, at that wavelength. Uh, so that's the benefits of a barium sulfate having a broader or larger number of uh, uh, absorption uh, uh, infrared mode, uh, phonon modes in the sky window. Okay, so this explains why barium sulfate performs better than uh, sodium dioxide. Okay, at, at, so nearly the end of my talk, I, I would like to uh, show this, that our work is covered by uh, Scientific American Journal uh, magazine. Uh, they show how this can address uh, the climate change. So 150 years ago, uh, Scientific American covered the story of really cooling. Now, uh, one and a half century later, uh, we have a better solution that is not only higher performance, but also scalable, uh, believe, we believe uh, scalable enough to address the climate change and energy saving savings. So at last, I want to acknowledge my group members. I already uh, showed individual members who contributed to research, but this is my group. We had a uh, special time over the pandemic and uh, finally happy that uh, we are getting all of that. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge my group alumni, uh, my collaborators and the current group members uh, who really um, have benefited uh, our research uh, and contributed to, um, to the uh, developments of the pains and other research. Uh, the sponsors, of course, um, primarily uh, the Cooling Technology Research Center at Purdue uh, Air Force Office Scientific Research and the National Science Foundation. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, email me uh, and then we can talk. Thank you.